Hey everyone, welcome back to another hardware news recap for the past week. The last couple days have been very heavy in the Vega department. We've got Vega FE right here. Review just went live, so if you haven't seen it, check that out. So Vega dominates a lot of the news cycle for the past couple days. There aren't too many other topics, but there are some important ones. For example, the Ryzen Pro line from AMD. And then in non-AMD news, there's also a new Western Digital 96 layer NAND coming out. And then Toshiba's new 4-bit per cell flash. We'll be talking about those along with some product launches for this week's recap. Before that, this coverage is brought to you by the Core G21 enclosure from Thermaltake, a $70 case with two 4mm thick tempered glass side panels, meshed ventilation in the front for breathability, a rarity in cases these days, and a power supply shroud with top-mounted SSD sleds. Learn more at the link in the description below. Before getting started, a couple of notes about the Vega FE review. The written review had a couple of extra lines in the conclusion that were important, and I wanted to bring them up in video form as well for the video audience. First of all, for uh, as stated in both forms of the review, Vega FE is not the best tool to try and extrapolate performance of RX Vega. There are too many variables still. It's best, as stated in the video review, to just have no expectations for RX Vega, wait for it to launch, and then we'll see if it's surprising or not at that time. But ideally, no expectations going into it. For example, there are still a lot of comments out there that are like, RX Vega is gonna be 30 to 40% faster. It's just, just maybe let's temper those a little bit so that there's not a big wave of disappointment because people have hyped themselves up really based on no official information other than kind of speculation, rumors, and things like that. So just a note on that again, we'll look at RX Vega when it's time to do so, but until that point, no, no real point in trying to speculate how it will perform. Uh, other notes on Vega FE, again, it is uh, in need of some driver updates. With Blender, I wanted to point this out. So Blender, we had issues with it crashing initially, and the crashes were not to desktop, it was just, it was a system hang and then either a blue screen or just a black screen, basically a shutdown event where you have to do a cold boot from that point. And we were able to somewhat work that out by working with the Blender Foundation, one of their cycles coders through Reddit messaging and kind of work it out, get it working in time for the review, got a render done, the numbers are in, so we have all the data, but uh, it still seems a little bit buggy in our work with it and it's, Really, I really can't say if it's Blender or if it's drivers at this point because a system hang could be a, a kernel event or a crash could be a Blender event. It's, it's really hard to say right now. But we're still having some issues. So uh, the point being that as stated in the review, the Blender testing could improve going forward at least in stability. We're not sure about performance. Performance could very well be the same, but there are a lot of different things that you can render uh, and with some specific types of rendering processes within Blender, for example, the tracing transparent shadows and working with that fur on one of the monkeys that we render could be causing a challenge for Vega specifically, and that might be leading to a kernel level crash or system hang. Uh, so we're still looking into that, still talking with the Blender Foundation. Hopefully AMD will, will uh, be able to provide some official information as well at some point once they've gotten a chance to look at it on their end. It is a long weekend though, um, but that's kind of updates on all that stuff. Otherwise, we do have initial numbers for you in the review if you're curious for more about Blender, but uh, hopefully we can do a lot more with it soon once it's more stable. So next topic, the first real topic for the last week of hardware news, Micron is set to discontinue the Lexar brand. Probably haven't heard Lexar too much lately, but it's been in the industry a while and Micron owns it and they're looking to discontinue it. Lexar was spun off from Cirrus Logic in 1996 and subsequently acquired by Micron in 2006. The discontinuation of Lexar is part of Micron's strategy to increase quote opportunities in higher value markets and channels or said in another way, focus on products with higher profit margins. Micron has vowed to support existing Lexar customers during the transition, but it looks like the company will be going away. Also interesting, Toshiba has started producing QLC, or quad level cell 3D NAND chips. These will have 16 charge levels, so that doubles what a 3-bit TLC module would have, or NAND flash. And many news outlets are saying that this is an alternative coming forward for TLC for desktop use. It's still a bit early to say if that's actually going to be the case, 
But either way, QLC is in production and research from Toshiba at this time. And the biggest thing to look out for will be more limited PE cycles or program erase cycles, which are estimated to be between 100 and 150, quite a bit lower than what we've seen with MLC, for instance. Moreover, QLC will require an advanced controller, different monitoring and error correction. Initially, Toshiba's QLC will focus on worm or write once, read many tasks. The new flash dies hold 768 gigabits or 96 gigabytes in a 64 layer stack. So a 16 die stack could offer 1.5 terabytes of storage. Toshiba has revealed plans for QLC SSDs offering 100 terabytes of data capacity. And this tags along with really everything else we already know about flash, which is as you, as you add more layers to the cell or more levels to the cell and you increase the charge level, you lose endurance, but you gain capacity at a lower cost. Hence the lower PE cycles, but the greater endurance. Again, looking at a 16 die stack being 1.5 terabytes or thereabouts. So there's no word on endurance right now, no real word on performance either in terms of the speeds. But for the time being, the new flash will probably be aimed at data center and enterprise where again, they are writing one time and reading a whole lot. So backup basically, or just very rarely ever programmed and erased uh, more than a couple times. Toshiba is planning to give us more information at the next Flash Memory Summit or FMS in August of this year. Western Digital alongside Toshiba as part of their joint venture announced BICS4 NAND or Bit Cost Scaling NAND Flash technology with new chips using 96 layers Western Digital's new NAND will include several configuration capacities and will use TLC and QLC architectures, speaking of. Presently, 96 layers is the largest layer count in the industry, and WD plans to offer components that are both TLC and QLC based with capacities ranging from 256 gigabytes to one terabyte. As previously stated, it's reasonable to expect that the QLC configs will be suited for data center and enterprise applications more so than consumer. WD plans to sample select 96 layer BICS4 dies by the second half of this year with mass production slated for 2018. Like Toshiba, Western Digital plans to offer more information also at Flash Memory Summit 2017 in August. With Vega being the focus lately, it feels like it's been a long time since Ryzen came out, but that's actually not the case. Ryzen Pro is slated to be the next line that AMD is pushing, and this will introduce six new SKUs in the Ryzen family. They are business targeted, as indicated by the Pro moniker, and the biggest changes here are advanced security measures, so they're for again, businesses, not something that a consumer would make use of. And then a different hypervisor setup, better manageability for enterprise and B2B type work, reliability, uh, an extended warranty. And then what, what AMD says is improved silicon quality. We don't really have any actual measurement of that or what exactly that means, but basically it sounds like more hand selected or at least semi binned or tested chips for Ryzen Pro. Ryzen Pro is expected to start rolling out in fall, and it looks like the main chips of note that we should be interested in are probably the Ryzen 3 units, because we haven't actually seen those on the desktop side yet. So for Ryzen 3, they've got Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 announced, and Ryzen 3 Pro 1200 announced, following the 1500 and 1400 of Ryzen 5, and those are both four core, four thread parts, they boost to, for the 1200, 3.4 gigahertz, and for the 1300 unit, they boost, it boosts to 3.7 gigahertz, with the rest of the units being familiar. So Ryzen Pro 1700X is eight core, 16 threads, as we know from the 1700X non-pro, still at 3.5, 3.7 gigahertz, so familiar clock speeds. Ryzen Pro 1700, three gigahertz, and 3.7 gigahertz boost, also eight core, 16 threads, and then Ryzen 5 is familiar here as well. So all the parts will be 65 watts, except the 1700X, which remains 95 watts as the non-pro unit does. Moving into product launches that were announced in the past week, one of the big ones is Intel's 545 series SSDs. These are the first 64 layer TLC 3D NAND SSDs coming to market, and they use a floating gate architecture. The Intel 545 series will use an SMI controller or silicon motion, and that's the SM2259 for the controller. It looks like it'll be a 2.5 inch form factor for SATA, 
but M.2 variants are expected to exist as well. The Intel 545s will launch in a 512 gigabyte capacity for $180 and the drive will come with a five year warranty. Finally, getting into peripherals, there are a couple of new mice coming out. MSI has got a new clutch gaming mouse and Thermaltake has the Nemesis Switch. These follow the biggest mouse launches of the year from Logitech, Corsair, and Razer with Logitech using a magnetic resonance charging surface that goes with their new G903 or whatever it's called that follows the G900 series. So that was one of the biggest ones. Now for cheaper options, there's a TTE Sports Nemesis Switch, it's called, which is supposed to be a $50 cheap RGB entry-level MOBA and MMO mouse focusing on macros and switches for the most part. It uses a PMW3360 sensor and that tops out at 12,000 DPI. Of course, that's not the only measurement. You also care about things like IPS. But the mouse uses a pretty standard 50 million click Omron switch. They're used in a lot of things these days, uh, really second to the 20 million switches in popularity for mice. And they have 12 programmable buttons on the mouse with five profiles. The interesting thing is that although there are 12 switches on the Thermaltake Nemesis switch mouse, they have four that are sort of hidden within the mouse. So these switches can be basically rolled into place while eight are uh, moved around in the mouse body. And we'll have some photos to show that off for you. But the other mouse, the MSI Clutch Gaming Mouse, is the Clutch GM60. It follows a line that MSI already launched. MSI not necessarily known for peripherals really at all, but everyone has to make them now. So they're using a PMW3330 sensor in theirs. 10K DPI sensor, and its counterpart, the GM70, uses a PMW3360 sensor. Both mice offer DPI stepping in 100 DPI increments and run a 1000 to 3000 hertz pulling rate. No word on price for the MSI Clutch mice, but they should be coming out in July with Thermaltake's ne Nemesis Switch coming out in quarter three of this year. So that's all for this news roundup. As always, you can subscribe to catch more. We're going to be working more with this card throughout the week and go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.